Amen. Well, this evening we're turning, please, to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus and chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Okay, Exodus chapter 33, and uh, we're going to, to begin uh, towards the end of the chapter. Uh, we're, going to be, we're going to begin at verse 13, sorry, verse 12, just to get the connection. Verse 12 of Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to read into chapter 34 as well. Verse 12 then of chapter 33, And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tab tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, Neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the her flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generations. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Amen. Pray God will bless his word to our hearts this evening. A common Jewish blessing is Baruch Hashem Adonai Elohim. Blessed be the name of the Lord God. Sometimes they would put Yisrael on the end, the Lord God of Israel. But Messianic Jews make it a wee bit longer. They say Baruch Hashem Adonai Elohim Yisrael Yeshua HaMashiach. Blessed be the name of the Lord God of Israel, Jesus the Messiah. And it's lovely that they put that little bit on the end. It's the same God. But they recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ is that God that they've been worshiping for so many generations. But the name of God is precious to the Jewish people. Hashem is the name of God. Hashem simply means the name. And whenever they're speaking or whenever they're writing about uh, that covenant name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, they will usually just change it to Adonai when they're quoting it or Hashem, the name whenever they're talking about it, uh, because it's so precious to them. We know that names in the Bible carry great meaning, and names carry great meaning to the Jews. Whenever we read of uh, the Antichrist, 
And we read about his number. It's the number of a man, 666. Don't think that it's 666. It's not. That's different. That's three individual sixes. Okay? It's 666. That's important because in the Jewish reckoning, every letter has a value. When you add up the letters of this man's name, whoever he's going to be, his letters in Hebrew will add up to 666. We won't know who it is. Don't even try to guess. Don't try to work it out. Don't waste time on it because we're not going to know. Because we'll be gone before he's ever revealed. So don't waste any time on that. It is a complete waste of time for the believer. Uh, we just preach that people won't have to see him. We want to see them saved so they'll never have to see him. But, but that all comes from the Jewish understanding of names and numbers. Adam, the first man, his name means red or earth. You remember that uh, one of Cain's ancestors was or descendants was called Edom. It's the same name but with different vowels. It means the same thing. It means red. It means earth. Uh, Daniel means God is my judge. Elijah or Eliyah means my God is Yahweh. Jesus, Yeshua, it means Jehovah or Yahweh saves. But the names of God that we see in scripture also carry great meaning. And throughout Genesis we see so many people calling on the name of the Lord. In chapter 4, Seth's son Enos is described as one who called on the name of the Lord, carrying on that godly line through Seth. In chapter 12, when Abraham enters the land God had led him to, he calls upon the name of the Lord. In chapter 13, when he returns to the land after going down to Egypt for a while, he calls upon the name of the Lord. It's a, it's a term of devotion to God. It's a term of commitment and surrender to God. Hagar, when she was cast out of the house uh, and, and gave birth to Ish, after giving birth to Ishmael, she was out on her own. And in chapter 16, we're told she received a promise from God and she called on the name of the Lord. Abraham at Beersheba in chapter 21 called on the name of the Lord. Isaac, when he was at Beersheba, he too called on the name of the Lord. So the name of the Lord is very, very important to the Jewish people in particular. In Exodus, we're commanded that his name not be taken in vain. God gave Moses this great privilege, as we see in chapters 33 and 34, this great privilege that when he said that he would make all his goodness to pass before Moses, what was it that Moses asked for? He said, show me thy glory. I want to see your glory. And what did God say in response? He said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Because the name of the Lord is so tightly entwined with his glory. And so the Lord proclaims his name in verses 6 and 7 by proclaiming who he is and what he does. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 34. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Here's a God who is holy, who is just, who is merciful, who is gracious and long-suffering and good and true. So whenever we think of the name of the Lord, it's very difficult to pin it down to one thing because our God is such a great God. And so he has many names in scripture. And, and tonight we're going to begin looking at some of the names of God. And we're thinking in particular tonight of this name Elohim. The name of the Lord reveals something about who he is. And, and as we think of this name Elohim, we can learn more about who he is. We can learn more about what he does, about his characteristics. And I hope that it encourages us in our faith and it strengthens us to be faithful to him. And this name is Elohim. It's the first name that's used for God in the Bible. If you look at Genesis 1 and 1, we know the verse so well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here it is in Hebrew. Bereshit bara Elohim. Et Hashemaim, but et, I'm sorry, what et, 
Aretz. That's it. Aretz. <laughs> this word here is Elohim. Okay. That's what Elohim looks like in Hebrew. And it's the first name given to God in the Bible. It speaks of his authority. Elohim speaks of his authority. It was by God's authority that he commanded the universe, the creation, to come into existence out of nothing. Is that not a great beginning to see our God? That the first name that we see, this name Elohim, speaking of his authority, and the first demonstration of that authority was to command creation to come into existence out of nothing. Whenever we see this word Elohim, it's actually in the plural form. You see that we, what well, looks like an apostrophe in a square box on the left hand side of the name. That's the end of the word. That shit tells us that it's in the plural. And yet, whenever we're referring to the one true God in the Bible using this name, the verbs and the adjectives are all singular. And so whenever we see this here, bara, this word bara in the middle in the top line here, means created. It's in the singular form. It's not in the plural form. This is the first evidence in the Bible that there's a trinity. And it's within the first three words. That there, you've got... A God in the plural, but he acts in the singular. It's a three in one in the very first verse in the Bible. I've already mentioned many times before that the Hebrew Old Testament is called the Tanakh. But there's another set of writings that aren't scripture. But they do give us a Jewish perspective on scripture. It's basically a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament. And it's called the Midrash. It's a collection of sermon notes and illustrations, mostly by the rabbis. And in Exodus, listen to what the Midrash says. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to those, You want to know my name? I am called according to my actions. When I judge, I am Elohim. And when I have mercy with my world, I am named Yahweh. And so the name Elohim tells us that God is both creator and judge. But I think the beautiful thing about how the Lord revealed himself to Moses, bearing in mind what these Jewish rabbis taught, is that he didn't just reveal himself as Elohim, the judge, but that he revealed himself as Yahweh Elohim, the merciful judge. And I think that was lovely that the, that that was brought in there by the Lord himself when he was revealing himself to Moses. Yes, he talks about his holiness and about his righteousness and his justice. That's in verse 7. But in verse 6, the first attribute that he gives to himself is mercy. Because that's what man needs. Man needs mercy. We need mercy as a nation. The state that we're in at the minute, we need the mercy of God. And praise God, we have a God who is merciful. I want you to see two things about his authority. First of all, he has natural authority because he's creator. Because he's creator, he is supreme and he's exalted over his creation. Let's turn into Colossians 1 and we'll see Paul talking about this there. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 16. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist or all things are held together. There's a lovely thought here as well. Whenever we look again at verse 16, that all things were created by him, he takes the time under inspiration to say whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now look back in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now keep looking at verse 12 and I'll go through it again. Principalities. Well, we're told that the principalities in Colossians 1.16 were created by God. We're told about the powers. The very next part in, in Colossians 1.16 says powers. It says the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's dominions in verse 16 in, in Colossians 1. And then you've got the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the thrones. Now, of course, when God created these, they weren't fallen. When God created them, they were perfect. They had no sin in them. But then, of course, Satan led a third of the angels of heaven in rebellion against God. They fell and they became the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places that we're wrestling against now. But God created them initially and therefore God has power over them. Never forget that. That while we're wrestling against these mighty powers and never think that they're, that they're insignificant, they are mighty powers. But while we're wrestling against these mighty powers, God is the one who has created them. Therefore, he has ultimate authority over them. And in Christ, we already have the victory. Look again for another reference to this in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. In verse 25. Isaiah 40 and verse 25. Reminding us that God is supreme over his creation. To whom then will you liken me or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, and not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest to Israel, My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, Elohim, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He is the mighty everlasting creator. The one who has authority over all things. And as creator, he has the right to impose his will on his creation. And he has the right to put moral boundaries upon his creation. You remember whenever he gave Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20? He introduced the Ten Commandments in verse 2 with, I am the Lord thy God, Elohim. I am the creator. Therefore he has the right to command. But his commands are for our good. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, John says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So many people think today that God gives the commands just to be a killjoy, but we know better than that. He gives us those commands so that we get more out of life. Because he loves us, he cares for us, and he has the right to put these impositions as some people see it upon us. But to give us these commands, to give us these rules, for how we can get the most out of these lives that we have to live on this earth. Because he's God. And because he is a loving God, we know that his commands will always be good for us. And so the Lord Jesus was able to say in Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we see that he is the one who has natural authority. He has that innate authority, that natural authority by, by reason of him being the creator of all things, to command us, but he does so for our good. But secondly, he has legal authority because he's also judge. Turn back in for an example of this into Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18 and verse 25. 
Okay, we'll do, um, we'll do from verse 23. Genesis 18, verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are, that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord is the judge of all the earth. Now that judgment has been particularly given to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you want to turn to it, it's in John 5 and verse 22. But the Lord is speaking uh, to the Jews, to the Jewish leaders. And he says in John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Whenever we look at what the Lord said here. We see that judgment has been committed to the son of God. That God has given to the Lord Jesus Christ. The right to judge the earth. As the son of God. Or as God the son. But he has also given him the right to execute the judgment. To carry out the sentence. That he chooses to pass. Because he is the son of man. And as the son of God. He has that divine authority. As the son of man. He has that creation authority. Because he has become a part of his creation. And he understands his creation. Therefore he has the right to judge his creation. And to carry out the judgment on his creation. Because he understands us. In Hebrews 2 we're told thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honour and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he hath put all things in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honour. That he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. You know the wonderful thing about the judgment. The execution of judgment being committed unto the son of man. Is that the son of man took the judgment that we should have suffered. And he took it in his own body. And as the son of man who can execute judgment against sinners. He allowed that judgment to be executed against himself on our behalf. What a wonderful statement of the love of God. Jesus had all things put under his feet. Because at the cross he righteously regained the kingdom authority that was legally lost by Adam in the garden. Adam was given dominion. And he lost that dominion. He surrendered it over to Satan. When Satan was tempting the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and he said all these will I give to you if you bow down and worship me and Jesus didn't contradict him he just rebuked him with the word of God because at that moment in time Satan had the authority over those kingdoms that's why he's called the God of this world but through, through Calvary Christ righteously regained that kingdom authority. He legally repossessed that authority. And now he is the judge of the whole earth. There are three primary judgments that the Son has authority to execute. The first is at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul, whenever he was writing to the Romans, he was writing to them about how they were treating one another in chapter 14. 
Look at Romans chapter 14 for a minute. We'll see that. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. And Paul says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's saying, why are you criticizing? Why are you trying to put one another down? That, this must have been a problem amongst the Roman believers. And that's why Paul addressed it. And he reminds them that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And so whenever we come to the table each Lord's Day morning, we're to come having examined ourselves before we come to the table so that we can eat and drink worthily. Because the day is coming when we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he's going to judge us on our own actions. And he's not going to be interested in what we think about other people and how they lived and everything else. He's going to be judging us according to our actions whether our actions were according to his will. He goes on then in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, or sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll see the context of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's verse 10. <clears throat> so Paul is saying here in verse 9 we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him we won't be accepted by Christ we want to receive his approval we want to see that, hear that well done my good and faithful servant and that's whenever he then says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ now it says that we might receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad does that mean that we're going to be judged according to our sins? No, it doesn't. Because our sins are gone. We are justified. It's impossible for us to be judged according to our sins. Because justified means just as if I'd never sinned. It's as simple as that. Whenever God looks at us, although we still sin day by day, as God looks at us, we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And he doesn't see our sin. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no consequences. Because when we sin, of course, we can't enjoy fellowship with God. And although he, he won't look upon our sin, although he won't dwell upon our sin, yet there is still that obstacle. Because we can only approach the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're living with unconfessed sin in our heart. The Holy Spirit's not going to work with us with that. And we would, it would be blasphemy for us to come in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we need to confess that sin. We need to have that sin forgiven. Before we can ever pray to God and expect to hear those answers to prayers. Uh, but we can enjoy fellowship with God once that sin has been confessed, once it's been dealt with and done away with. So whenever it says whether it be good or bad, it doesn't mean whether it is righteous or unrighteous or whether it's uh, holy or unholy. But it's whether it's acceptable or unacceptable. Those things that are unacceptable for God will come through the fire as wood, hand, stubble and will be burnt up. Those things that are acceptable will come through as gold, silver, and precious stones and will be acceptable before God. So that's what it means whenever we come to the judgment seat of Christ. But there's another encouragement in this chapter because this is the chapter that has a very, very well-known verse on it. And we usually use it in relation to the gospel. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. You know what that means? It means that whenever we are judged to receive the things done in our bodies, 
we're judged according to those things that we are now able to do because we are new creatures in Christ. That's what makes them acceptable to God. When we do our work for God, when we live for God in the power, in the, the new life that he has given us, those new things that we now have because of salvation, they'll be accepted by God. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll hear that well done. We've been given all that we need. So that the deeds done in these bodies please the Lord. The second judgment, and we'll just do this very quickly, is the judgment of tribulation. Turn over into Revelation 5. We'll not do much more than just read this. Revelation 5. <clears throat> And beginning at verse 1. Now bear in mind that the seals on the book that's in heaven are judgment seals. And in verse 1 it says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And so we see that these judgments that are going to commence during the tribulation period, as God pours out his wrath upon the earth, these seals, these judgments are initiated by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is Elohim, who is God, the one who has authority to execute judgment. There's one other judgment that we're not going to spend any time on. And it happens at the end of the tribulation period. And before the millennial reign of Christ. And that's the sheep and goats judgment. It's a judgment of nations and not of individuals. And so we're going to pass over that one. And get to the last one. It's the great white throne judgment. In Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. And verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So here we have, sorry, I was reading chapter 19, wasn't I? I said chapter 20, silly me. Well, now we know who it is. We've seen the description of who it is. It's coming. Sorry, chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Not out what, what was written in the book of life, but the things which were written in the other books, which were the records of their lives. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
So we see these three judgments that the Lord has authority to do. It's the, great, the, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of tribulation, and the great white throne judgment. But I want to finish just by looking at a couple of the names that Elohim is joined together with. Because sometimes we see not just God on its own, but we see the name of God with something else. And they're called the compound names of God, just because they're, there's more than one part to them. The first one, uh, and you don't need to turn to, to these passages, the first one that we see is Elohim Chaim, or the living God. Let me give you some examples. David, whenever he's speaking to Saul, just before he fights Goliath, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Isn't it wonderful that whenever there are those who would defy God, those that would challenge God, that we're reminded he is the living God and he doesn't stand idly by. Hezekiah, whenever Sennacherib, was threatening the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah said, Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to, re which hath sent him to reproach the living God. The psalmist in Psalm 42 and verse 2, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Well, don't you love it whenever someone who was a pagan and real, realizes who God really is. And declares it. In Daniel chapter 6 we hear Darius the maid. He says I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom. Men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. And steadfast forever in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the end. Isn't it wonderful that a man who had worshipped false gods for all of his life came and said those words that he, God, is the living God. None other. And the Lord Jesus Christ calls himself the living God. In Revelation 1, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. In fact, if the Lord Jesus Christ isn't alive, if he's not the living God, our faith is vain. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was talking about resurrection. That's what he said. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And then he says with triumph, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So he's the living God. And the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, because I live, ye shall live also. The living God. But then there's Emmet Elohim, the true God. And Jeremiah says, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. David was able to say, everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped, because God is the living God. Whenever John was greeting uh, the elect lady and her children in Second John, he, he uses the word truth at least four times. The elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And why is it so important that our God is the true God? Because of the promises that he's given us. God is true. And Paul said to the Corinthians that because of that our word toward you was not yea and nay. He says for all the promises of God in him that is in Christ are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. How do we know that we're saved? Because God promised it. How do we know that the Holy Spirit indwells us? Because Christ told us he would come. How do we know that Christ is alive? Because he's alive in us and he promised to be there. How do we know that he's coming back again? Because he said he would. And that's how we know that there's a heaven waiting for us and that we're secure for all eternity and that there's an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for us. And that's how we know that we're going to be with the Lord forever and it's how we know that our sins will never again be remembered because God is the true God. Finally, there's 
Elohim Bashamim, God in heaven. Listen to some of the references for God in heaven. Deuteronomy 4.39, his omnipresence. Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above. And upon the earth beneath there is none else. Think of his omnipotence. Second Chronicles 20 and 6. O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? The God in heaven is ever present and he's got absolute power and authority but he's also got absolute wisdom. I love these words of Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And he's recited the dream to him and told him the interpretation thereof. Why? Because he was able to turn to the God in heaven who knows all things. The God we worship it's Elohim, the God who has absolute authority, the creator, the judge of all the earth. And the wonderful thing is he bids us come to him. And he bids us to know him. And he bids us to bring our request to him in prayer. For he is Elohim. And he is the, the authority whenever we come to him in prayer to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. I trust that, that will help us as we come pray to him this evening. Amen.